Okay. And thank you to you guys. Now that we've got your attention. <laughs> okay, so everybody else is in the cafeteria for an hour. I have found a fruit stand. I thought that would be a good place to grab me something for lunch, and there were two men there, and when they saw me, they came over to me, and they said to me, you look like you're from the United States. And I've been through Thailand and all kinds of places, and I usually walk up to somebody and say, now, I'm not from this country, but... And Calvin always tells me, you don't need to tell anybody that. But they came up to me and said, I, I, uh, you look like you're from the United States. And I said, yes, I am. And we chatted back and forth a little bit. And they said, the reason we wanted to talk with you is because we are, I am a Palestinian. And this is my brother. He's not a blood brother. He's a brother in God. And he is an Israeli person. And we have had this fruit stand together for a good long time. We really care deeply for each other. One's family seems like the other's family. And since you are from the United States, we would like you to go home. And we would like you to find someone that you can tell. We believe that if the leaders would allow us, both Palestinian and Jewish, if the leaders would allow us, we would live as brothers and sisters. We could figure out how to share this world together. We are afraid because of all the news that you see the people will not know that. Would you please go tell them that for us? I went back a few years later, and I found the same fruit stand and the same two men there. I went up and I introduced myself to them, knowing they would not remember me, but that I would never forget them. I told them about our previous visit together, and I said, I have told many people as I've moved around your words, your exact words, and I'm honored to have had them to share. And they said, we would like you to still tell that story, for the times are even worse, and we want people to know, and we want to keep reminding ourselves that we are together, one in God. I said, I will. I'll go back, and I'll keep telling your story. And so this is one of those times, times for you. I share those brief encounters because one of the things they said to me was, we don't know what to do, but we do know who to be. We don't know what to do, but we do know who to be. I say that because we have a scripture, wasn't it a doozy of a scripture for this morning? Gnashing of teeth and weeping and all of that, that's Matthew for you. I think it's in the New Testament seven times, and four or five of them are in Matthew. He just likes to stir things up. But I, I share that with you because Matthew, Matthew knows the people to whom listen to his message throughout history will not always know what to do in their life, in the life of the world. But he wants them to know always who it is that they are to be. I'd like us to take that idea, and I'd like us to take it not just to the parable of Jesus that Jim read to you today, but to the two in the preceding weeks. Now, I'm not going to preach on all of these, don't worry. <laughs> but, but I do want us to know that each of those parables are joined together. They each have Jesus' fingerprints on them, and each of them has Jesus' fingerprints on the other two. I'd like us to hear them and, and kind of the, the one word that they're pointing out and what the, Jesus had in mind. Now remember, he's talking to the religious leaders of the temple. That's who got these three parables. They got these three parables, and, and, and they were ready. It was close in time. They were out to get Jesus by this time. And they preferred, they did prefer, they did prefer to catch him in his words and let Jesus condemn himself. But every time they tried, Jesus told a story. Jesus told a story and to the temple leaders, and then he asked them each time in each of these three parables, he asked them a question so that they might take a look at what, who the God figure was in the parable and how 
they were asked to respond to the way in which that God would respond to the point. Now, I want us to hear it, and I want us to hear these points hitting home for us, too. Not religious leaders in Jerusalem, not out to get anybody, we, know, we would say. But I'd like to hear, not in judgment to us, which ended up with those leaders condemning themselves, so it became their own judgment. But I'd like to, us to hear them as an invitation. I'd like us to hear it as a reminder to the God that's within us. And I'd like us to hear it as a call. Well, we are in that deciding business of in life in many fashions. We don't know what to do, but we know who it is that we are to be. That we are to be. I'd like us to hear the first parable's word. And that was two Sundays ago. Some of you were there. I wouldn't have remembered what it was if I were sitting in your seats. But I, but I would like to raise the word obedience. That that two week ago sermon, that parable pointed out and held up obedience. And that's our invitation. That is our call. That is our reminder. I'd like us to see obedience. Um, I'd like us to look within ourselves and find what, what is it, who is it to whom we are obedient. That means who is it by whom we are led? Who do we follow? To whom are we faithful? To whom do we give amenability? I love that word, amenability. Because unless I spelled it wrong, it starts with amen. Amen. I love the word amen. You've already said it several times, and you'll say it more before you leave this room on this day. It's always at the end of our prayers, and it's often at the end of some sacred thought that's held out and given to us. We say amen sometimes without even thinking about it, but I want you to say it, hearing it always in this way. When you have just prayed something and you say amen, I would like you to see that as meaning from that idea I take my next step. I'd like you to see it from the idea, with that idea I walk, not just today, but through God my whole life. Christ's fingerprints are upon that word and upon every time we've said it by ourselves and together. So the first parable offered us that look into ourself for obedience. When we look into ourself and answering the question I just asked of where, what does it mean to you and what does it mean to your walk in life, when you find some answers, some glimpses of answers, let that ferment. Let that germinate, let that walk with you, not just this day, but always. And let it become, let it become that which illuminates your life in an ever new way and illuminates the darkness of the stairs before you that you might be ready to step out through them into the light again. Let's take the fingerprints of Jesus and that parable to last week's parable. Last week's parable, last week's parable is a little, um, I guess it means more than anything. It means how do we react to God's leaders? First, you've got to figure out who are God's leaders, because a lot of people speak in the name of God and, and might not, might not um, feel from the God that is within us that it is, is what we are really hearing. I've told some of you before, when I was a little girl, and we heard a revival preacher preaching, as we drove home from church that night, I was about seven years old. And my, he had told us that our hearts were black. <laughs> and for some reason, that wasn't supposed to be good. And then he put something in this black water, and phew, it was all clear again. It sure got everybody's attention. But my mom didn't care so much about that, but she sure did care about what somebody speaking in God's name had said to her little girl and the others who were there. And so she said to me, did that sound like God to you, what that preacher said tonight? And she said it in a, such a way that she invited me to say, no, it didn't. And she said then he was probably doing the best he could. Didn't sound like God to me either. 
And so, and so this has Christ's fingerprints on it as we take a look at God's leaders and to recognize also that there is an internal and eternal truth within us that is put there by God. The God made every one of us born perfect, whole, and holy. And then we were born. And some of us were very lucky where we were born. And others found more challenges. Because we were born into a place and a time and a culture, and as we hear the news now, into a system that can grow thing terrorism things that can impact us. They can either work to support and grow and affirm that God-given gift that stays in us that nothing can change, or it can mess up that God who made us for a time. We can invite the clarity and power to support the children that grow up in this church in such a way that they've got the same base I had in the parking lot that night when my mom said, does that sound like God to you? Okay, now today's parable, with the weeping and gnashing of teeth and all. You won't hear that again from me. I said it now. Uh, let's call this one word that we want to hold on to, the word authority. Authority. It's, leaders are trying to catch Jesus in what they see to be his self-imposed authority, his self-assumed authority in authority, and they are there to stop him. Authority asks us to look inside of us and to say, about what do I place my faith? From whom do I receive guidance? Upon where do I lay my heart? Who has the say-so in all the various parts of my life? Who accompanies my walk? Who plays the processional in which I walk? And when I'm ready to leave this earthly plane, who will be playing the recessional that will welcome me there? I hope it's Anne and Kendall. Obedience, first parable. Second parable, who leads us? And third, where does my authority lie? In us all, Jesus fingerprints no matter what, no matter what. Jesus says, you were born into this place and this purpose and this time. It's about time, though, for me to get to that real quickly, that third parable that Jim had the fun of reading on this day, that third parable about the king's banquet he was giving to his son for his son's wedding. Now, pastors, you ought to ask them sometime, tell me about some of the weddings you've done. <laughs> it seems like almost every wedding has something that goes wrong accidentally, and then the bride and groom laugh about that forever. But, but the tough weddings, the tough weddings are the ones that reveal the fault lines that already exist among the people in the room. And this parable, this wedding parable, is fraught with fault lines. What did the king do? He was going to throw a big bash for his son's wedding reception, and he sent out a save the date to all the A-list people. Maybe some of you would have been on that. But when the time came, he did something extra. He sent out someone to tell everybody that everything's ready, it's time for them to come, and tell them how lucky they are they're going to be able to share this day. And what was the surprise? is that they rejected that invitation. And they started making up excuses about why they wouldn't go you know, to Meghan and Harry's wedding, imagine. So a second guy goes out, and he's sweetening the deal. This time, he's to tell the description of what the menu's going to be. And still, they were so unimpressed that it, for them, it was still business as usual. So to fa save face, the king says, bring all the people from the byways and the highways and the thoroughfares and the back streets. I've got to have somebody to fill this room. Things begin to go completely off rail. The servants are sent out, and they're seized, and they're abused, and they're murdered. And then the weirdness really takes over, because while they're trying to keep that food warm back in the palace, 
the murderers themselves get murdered. And that's the end of that parable. <laughs> but Matthew slides another little parable in. He tacks on to that parable a whole different one, and it's got the guy, well, the king. He's finally got his people, okay? Now he's going to go mingle with a crowd that he never would have mingled with before. And as he goes around and sees what's going on, he comes to that one guy that's not dressed at all like he should be at a king's banquet. Now, if I were that guy, I would have said, I, I would have said, when I got up this morning, remember, I had not gotten an invitation, and I had no idea I was coming to a banquet. That's what I, no, I probably wouldn't have. I would have just sat there like he did, frozen in my seat, frozen in my seat. I don't know what he had on. First century cargo pants and Crocs? I don't know what it was. <laughs> but whatever it was, it really ticked off the king. And this parable seems, when we come down to it, to represent far too many folks in the late first century that were so glad to be a part of the early Christian church. It was really the place to be. But they didn't realize. And even if they did, they somehow refused to participate in what it means to love and serve and include all people no exceptions. They seemed to miss the point that they were called to live out the fingerprints of Christ in their life and everywhere they went. And so, what it says in Matthew in one way or another at the end of that parable is, if you've come to the banquet, get on your party dress and get with the program, you Christians at the end of the first century. Why is it sometimes so easy to hear a parable like that and wonder if I might have made the A list? Probably not. What excuses would I have had if I didn't want to go, but I did get invited, either as number one, invite two or three? And would I have been one of those leftover folks when it comes to counting? One of those backstreet boys and gals? Not the kind that feels worthy to walk into a banquet hall. Or maybe I'd have been that person that showed up and was kicked out because for whatever reason, I didn't seem like one of the acceptables in the world. Maybe because of the political party I was on, or, or maybe it was some, it I didn't fit exactly an acceptable place on the gender spectrum, or, or maybe because I'm really past my prime, maybe because I'm not what I used to be, or maybe I've, Maybe, maybe I've just stacked up too many strikes against me from my past, and I can't imagine that bouncing off in me and making me ready to be accepted in this story. I don't know. I don't know what there might be in your mind that comes to your mind that means I don't quite fit, I don't, I don't know that I matter, I don't know I belong. This parable hits home for everybody in some kind of way. But what if? That's Jesus' fingerprints for sure. Jesus' fingerprints saying, what if? What if this parable, this moment, this place in the gym is not a time you should be thinking back on anything that judges you, yourself, or from another? What if? What if this parable is asking us, are we willing to have mercy shown to us? Are we willing to have mercy shown to us? Mercy is kind of a religious term. What about release? What about freedom? What about grace? What about blessing, a gift of God? What if that's Christ's offering this morning? What if this is the day we are ready God's ready to transform the desert of our spirit through the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Hear the words of Father Robert Barron, Catholic priest, author, religious correspondent for NBC, and informally called the Bishop of the Internet. He writes, why worry excessively about what came before? 
Why obsess over your past? Live joyously, walking ahead. For always God is opening up the desert of your spirit. You have a God who makes all things new. I came to this church stumbling over a piece of my past. And sometimes it laughs at me, and sometimes it hits me again. I don't know about you, but when I talked about something in your past that seemed to hold you back and drag you down, some of you may have thought of something yourself. But I came to this church, and I've never missed a Sunday probably ever in my life, hardly. But I came to this church one day, and I've never left. I came to this church who said, we are here to love, serve, and include all people, no exceptions. And that spoke to a lot of people that I'd seen in my life that did not know God was for them too. And I, then I heard, Jim came. And then I heard, and my heart started smiling like it had not ever before. And my steps got lighter, and I was surprised the first time he said it. Maybe you were too. I was surprised he, the first time he said it. As a matter of fact, I was standing beside him ready to serve communion. I think I just served communion, yeah, so I felt really holy. <laughs> and then he said, and then he said it. He read those words. He's read them often to you. Unless you're here the first time, you've heard them many times. I don't know what he'll read today, but I bet he changes his plan and reads it. I don't know. <laughs> when I heard it, I almost stopped him right there. I almost said, Jim, would you read that again? Run that last line by me. Let me see what it, what it really says if I heard it right. Life is short. And there isn't much time for us to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be quick to love. Make haste to be kind, resting assured that God is now and always has been infinitely more concerned with your future than your past. And the blessing of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon us stay and remain with us forever. Thank you, Jim. <laughs>